this Zoom replay was originally streamed July 2020 from Menlo Retreat and Dewa Spa. To learn more about upcoming in-person and online programs, please visit our website at menla.org. Exciting on one hand, and in another way, um, it's a little sad because we're in such a difficult and uh, challenging time. And, you know, the interest in refuge is not always um, the sign of good times. It was a film that we made actually just after uh, 9-11. Um, it had been uh, conceived as a movie about Buddhism and Hollywood. And we were very busy with that agenda, uh, but then the World Trade Centers were destroyed. Um, in fact, Bob and I may speak about it later on. My Lama actually predicted that the 9-11 event uh, was going to happen. So after 9-11, we sort of reoriented ourselves to the yearning, the need for spiritual grounding or a, a strong orientation uh, in society after such a chaotic and traumatic event. Um, so we decided to make refuge what it is uh, today. Um, I, I do want to give you some of you a fair warning because there is a, a llama in the film who at the time um, we were not aware of his uh, proclivity for uh, sexual, um, what do we call it these days? You know, um, exploitation. I had already asked the Dalai Lama about sexual exploitation and also uh, Tenzin Palmo because I knew it was an issue. In fact, I'd been sexually accosted myself by one of um, the leading Tibetan doctors uh, that uh, did not disrupt my, my um, investment or uh, confidence in the Dharma. Um, and that's, that's a, an interesting topic to go into. But anyway, it's the Sakyong Mipham Rinpoche who, as of about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, had been uh, revealed to be quite a predator. Um, so we knew that these kind of things were happening. Um, there was a time when people didn't speak about this out loud. Uh, it was a sort of uh, taboo almost to discuss it at all. But um, I hope that Bob and I will go into some of those uh, kinds of uh, conversations um, and visit that, particularly since the uh, Me Too movement has, has fortunately uh, erupted, not only in the broadcast entertainment field and in, in the corporate world um, and in, in uh, this, the, the religious world as well. Of course, we all know that. And uh, Tenzin Palmo, who's Jet Sunma, a, um, a female a PhD nun, uh, we'll meet her a few times in the film. Refuge, um, you know, when we take refuge, uh, the idea is that we kind of establish um, a new relationship with reality. We're saying sort of we're abandoning our previous um, relationship, understanding, attachment, identification with reality, and we even get a spiritual name. So the whole idea is to uh, reorient ourselves through a new uh, method of looking at ourselves in the world. And that process, um, we're going to learn a little bit about that tonight uh, in the film. I want to say a very vigorous thank you to Tibet House and Menla, not for hosting this film only. Thank you for hosting the film and making it available to, uh, to our friends tonight. But um, for the very... Uh, you know, huge work they're doing to keep the opportunities available for all of us to find refuge, to work on our minds, our bodies, our health, um, and to transform how we perhaps relate to uh, the physical world, the political world, the social world, the ecologic world, etc. cetera. Um, so thank you, Menla and Tibet House for all the hard work you're doing under these very, very difficult and challenging times, not only financially, but 
uh, socially. As a matter of fact, I believe that there's a, a matching grant now for Tibet House and Menla that whoever uh, can uh, donate or contribute to the philanthropy, to the organization, uh, there'll be a matching fund for that amount. So donate $500 and the matching donor uh, who's anonymously provided some funds will match your or our donations. So um, without further ado, here comes Refuge. Thank you all so much. And it's exciting to know that we're all here together, that our community tonight, we're breathing, we're watching, we're sensitizing ourselves all together here as a community. And it's a, a real privilege for me to be able to provide the, uh, the space, the medium, the environment where um, this can happen. And uh, it is intended as a healing film. So thanks for staying with it. And through the, uh, the body of the film, and at the end of the film, we'll have a wonderful um, interaction with, with Robert Thurman, our dear friend and founder of Tibet House. Thank you. Okay, yeah. It's a great, uh, it's a film is really great to see all those folks in film. It's totally awesome. I don't know if I'm hearing you now. Oh, uh, we can hear you. Oh, good. Oh, now I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. Well, thank you, Wyatt. Okay, so um, to everyone, if people are still here, do they have questions? Do we have a Q&A panel here? So will Wyatt feed us the questions? I don't know. We have, a, we have the two things. We have chat. We have the chat thing and we have the uh, Q&A, which we can look at ourselves. Well, Bob, I can tell you that Carolyn Christie asked us if we wouldn't mind please um, sharing with people our experiences it, with the refuge process itself. Your experience with taking refuge and maybe she also implies uh, the guru yoga and, and my experience with, with with the refuge experience because so many people don't know firsthand what that experience and what that process is like, Bob. Right. But I, I think different people have different experiences with it. Uh, but uh, you, you, you yourself wrote the text for the film, right? I wrote it with Les Levine. Right, right. So the two of you wrote it. And so there you expressed your view of refuge, I think, a bit. Well, and, you know, um, in hindsight, I mean, uh, I didn't know, Bob, when I was taking refuge that I was going to enter into a training program. I wasn't uh -huh. aware of that. I, I thought, think. you know, my, my thing was I want to heal myself. I want to, you know, kind of recover from my own, from my own mind. Yes. But I didn't know after 30 years that I would have been trained to um, shape my own mind. Yes be my own um, you know, navigator. Well, that's good. Do you, why, why do you call it training instead of educating? Um, because I, I liken it to a physical experience in a way, like um, in a way that the brain is actually getting a new piece of neuroplasticity and the body well, is orienting itself in a tactile way, a reorientation okay. to the energy, to interconnectivity feelings. So in a way, I, I liken it to, to a training program. Uh, but we can use all kinds of words for it. Of course, it's an educational program. Well, the, the word the Buddhists use, you know, the three, the three higher educations, Adi Shiksha. Huh. Uh, you know, the, at, at the education, the higher education in ethics, higher education in meditation, and higher education in wisdom. And uh, everyone translates that as trainings, three higher trainings. I see. Okay. And uh, and um, but uh, I, I I don't like that myself. Oh, I don't. I, see. I don't. I refuse to be trained. Oh yeah. Well, there there are so you train soldiers to fight. Okay. You train dogs not to pee in the house. Yeah. And uh, and the cats to stay in the litter box, but humans are educated. You know. And that can include the body, you know, you educate them in, you know, martial arts or everything. But anyway, I'm just kidding. I sort of pick at you. So that's great. So, so have you changed your mind since you made that film? I noticed from the people talking, and I want to say one thing is I was so moved 
especially by Melissa Matheson's footage, you know, your yes. interview with her. Yes. Because she passed away, sadly, very sadly. She was a dear friend and a board member of Tibet House and so on. Yes. And, uh, and she was so vital and she was so eloquent and I really liked, I loved the way she talked and I really realized how much I miss her, that's all, you know. Oh, you know, the moment I met Melissa, I, I really fell in love with her and recognized that she's an incredible mother, you know, for her children. And she came out, Bob, that was her second interview, she came out of her, her trauma with Harrison with the, after the divorce. Yes. She came out and did that interview in the middle, yes. of, that, in the middle of that trauma. Uh, sure. She wanted to give back. She wanted to really connect with the Tibetan freedom movement again. Yes. And after that interview, she told me, John, I'm so motivated. I want to get back involved with the, you know, with the movement. And she yes. got involved with Tibet House and ICT. Yes. Well, yes. Uh, yes. You know what well, I'm saying? So, she, was going to, she was considering uh, writing, you know, the Kundun deals with one third of his holiness's life, or less than a third, until he escapes, you know, from Tibet at, at the age of 24. And he's now 85, so 60 years, yeah. 61 years of life, which we have in the, you know, Man of Peace uh, illustrated biography. Yeah. Which makes a perfect... Um, uh, you know, what do you call it? Um, uh, what do you call it for film when you have like cartoons that go carry you through the story? Animation? Uh, yeah, well, no, but not animated but version, but uh, it has a name for the, when you ski, sketch out scenes in a, in a film. Storyboard. Yeah, exactly. It's a storyboard. Story, storyboard. Right. I, oh, yeah, okay. Right. Storyboard. Yeah, it's she, a perfect she, storyboard. She was interested. She was, we, had, we talked a little bit before she passed. Because I was already working on that, and she was interested in writing a second, you know, Kundun 2. <laughs> right. But sadly, she passed. That's terrible. I'm so sad. Anyway, anyway. so what about people's questions, though? Or, or you know, what about, the, what are they, someone is saying something that I thought of, actually, during the film over here in the Q&A. Do you have the Q&A up, John? Do you see it? Yes, I'm looking at q and I'm seeing, um, sorry for my question, what made John to make this film? How long did it take for John to make this oh, film? Oh, okay, you can answer that one. So there's, a, there's a question. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for your question. I, I, uh, I've been a film fanatic all my life, and in high school I had a fantastic mentor who uh, showed us movies 25 times a, d a week. We would watch Fellini movies, Truffaut, etc. We learned to deconstruct movies and analyze them, and I recognized what a powerful force film can have in helping us reorient ourselves and change our lives and change the world. So um, when filmmakers started making films about the Dalai Lama, uh, Kundun, Seven Years in Tibet, Little Buddha, Oliver Stone made Heaven and Earth, I discussed this with my Lama, Shempen Rinpoche, and I said, gee, Rinpoche, it looks like so many directors are getting involved with this subject matter, why don't I make a film that really examines their motivation for, you know, connecting with Buddhism and telling these stories in a very big, big picture, big screen. Well, that, that movie was called Buddhism in Hollywood. And when 9-11 occurred, we were in the middle of fundraising for the Buddhism in Hollywood film. Mm -hmm. But um, we realized, my God, you know, uh, this extraordinary shock shock wave through the entire world uh shaking us up and that we really need refuge we really need a uh, substance in a film that can carry us that can hold us that can give us a strong uh, reverberation that will help us tune into our own buddha nature like a tuning fork so we, we made the films the film uh, footage came from material i shot in 1987, when um, my Lama, Dujarimpeche, had shrunken, and we started to film this uh, big project back in Nepal, when his, um, his body, called Kudung, Sacred Remains, was brought to Nepal. We continued filming through 2002, after receiving funding, um, you know, just after 9-11. My executive producer, Dinah uh, Beekner, raised the money 
uh, bless her soul for that. Uh, previously, we had some funding from Swiss TV to make a very short film um, that included a lot of footage about Marty and, and Kundun for Swiss TV. Bear in mind that the first thousand Tibetans uh, were sort of invited to Switzerland uh, by the Kuhn brothers. Um, and this is back in early 1960s. So, in fact, a lot of the cast for uh, Kundin came from the Tibetan community in Switzerland. So Swiss TV was very excited about that. That's a little just a brief, you know, sketch about how it, how it all began. It did take many years. Yeah. Well, I, I, w I think we should answer the first question before that. How can an organization deal with sexual misconduct allegations? Okay. Thank you. You first, Bob. Without disturbing the faith of those who follow the guru or teacher and want to continue to follow and believe when others want to tear him apart. <laughs> Thank you, it says. Well, I, know, got, I, I, I like that you, in the film uh, that you... Um, you did show the leader of the, the one who's called Sakyong, the son, son of Chongba Rinpoche, uh, who was talking there, but who has been accused very strenuously of sexual misconduct. That's right. And is no longer leading that organization, I believe. I don't know. I that's think. correct. And um, I haven't followed it too closely. Yes, that's and correct. Then, and then the Dalai Lama mentioning about teachers who may not fully understand what they're teaching, uh, being attracted by sex and money. So I like that you showed two sides to that. Although I must confess, I was a little, I was not happy seeing the Sakrong there telling us about refuge. I'm not happy either seeing him. When, when clearly he's, he himself was not a refuge. Yeah. But, but that's another point. I think that um, one thing I'd like to say is that some of the people kind of acted like, and it was not made clear, I think, to the viewer of the film, that refuge is not a refuge in a particular guru, actually. The person who administers the ceremony of refuge is representing all the Buddhas and all the Bodhisattvas, and you know, one is supposed to consider they're all present, and one is making one's refuge vows in front of all of them and not just the person who is, who is administering it, although ideally the person who administers it will be a good example of that type of, of a reliable person. Thanks, Bob. But, but, but that's an important, the reason I make that point, and it's important, is that should there be some imperfection of the actual administering Lama, that does not invalidate the refuge with the Buddhas. And, uh, and one, you know, one reaches through the, the whole concept of relationship with the guru in the way it's analyzed very carefully in the Tibetan teachings is that the guru becomes a kind of lens which the student uses to imagine the, the real Buddha uh, or in, a particular, in, in later initiations, particular forms of the Buddha. And um, just like a statue in a temple of Shakyamuni Buddha, no Buddhist thinks that is Shakyamuni Buddha, but it still is a way of channeling the energy, reaching as a, it becomes a vessel or a channel of the energy of Shakyamuni Buddha. And in case that statue has a flaw or a crack in it, it has some kind of problem with it, <laughs> yeah. you know, bronze disease or something, then that still doesn't invalidate Shakyamuni Buddha. So the faith should be a faith in Buddha, that there is such a thing as a Buddha, a perfected being who is a proper refuge, that there is a Dharma, which is a realistic teaching about the nature of reality, and that there is a community of sincere people who are trying to reach that uh, reality and become Buddhas themselves, and they're there to help you. So that all, all of that becomes a kind of refuge. And uh, then if a particular person lets you down, you're not going to throw out uh, the baby with the... Uh, or actually... You're not going to throw out the bathwater with the baby. Right. <laughs> you might remove that baby from the bath, but yeah. the bathwater will still be good. And so, uh, so I think that's a, that helps with that question. Now, I have lost my chat thing. There seem to be more questions in the chat. Bob, I'd like to just add something to your comment. Yes, please do. The person asked, what, what, can, they, what can we do if this happens in yes. a community? And, and my position is the, the Lama or the perpetrator the uh, 
proposed or, you know, um, perpetrator should be uh, confronted uh, in open within the community. The community should provide mental health uh, services for that person or people who are being abused. And the community should also provide ongoing support. In many cases in the community, the uh, victim is considered a pariah, a yeah. negative impact. And we have to not let that happen. Mm -hmm. This is why I asked His Holiness the Dalai Lama these questions. And before I asked those questions, I asked his nephew, Tenzin Takla, and his translator, may I ask His Holiness about sexual exploitation? Because I myself had been exploited sexually by a leading Tibetan medical physician. And I knew of other people who were victimized by Sogyal Rinpoche, personally. So I thought it's better for us on the inside to confront this, this, this disease from inside out and begin the healing process from inside out rather than from, uh, you know, the outside. Okay. That's good. There's another thing I think that's important, which is that even if a teacher behaved very badly and unfortunately too many have, yeah. uh, that nevertheless, if one was with such a teacher for a while, or and originally attracted, then it's likely that some of the things one learned from that teacher were beneficial. And so when one rejects the teacher, which one is allowed to do, uh, in, the, in the sort of tantra tinge Tibetan Buddhism, there is a kind of undercurrent, of, oh, if you go against the teacher, then you'll go to hell and all this, Vajra hell and all this kind of thing. Yeah. But that's not correct. That is very no, incorrect. No. So the point is, one, sh one can reject a teacher and say, that guy sucks. Yeah. And, I am not, and I will, and the Dalai Lama used to say, we had conferences where we discussed these subjects with him. And he used to say, go to the press, you know, <laughs> expose them to the journalists and so forth, you know, and go to the newspapers, he used to say. So don't take it lying down. But don't hate the person. And don't, don't ignore the good things, whatever they were, that you learned from the person. So in other words, because you reject the person as an imperfect vessel, you must uh, stick with what was good that came about in, from that. And, and uh, that's very important. And then, then you don't have to be so traumatized as people get. They get too extreme. You know, this person says, tear them apart. Well, they have a right to, uh, you know, to uh, criticize them, and they should. But uh, then they should remember whatever was good as well and not hate them. That's the key thing. Okay? Beautiful, Bob. What's another, what's another question now? Uh, Kathy, oh, Nat Jones, how do we deal with teachers who use the image of the Dalai Lama to promote themselves to the general public, but in private speak badly about him to his students? Oh, 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 oh. Wow. <laughs> well... I, I, I think I know what, what uh, you're referring to, and I, I've witnessed this sort of thing. And I think the way of what you do with that is you politely dissociate yourself from such teachers uh -huh. <laughs> who behave in such a hypocritical manner, I would say. I, that's what we do, personally, because they're teaching, no. they're teaching hypocrisy, and that's not good. We need to believe that the system we're using um, is stronger than the system we're leaving. You know, that our, our neurotic patterns and all this business, first of all, there's a lot of value in, in our experiences in, in our past. But when we build that boat, when we get in that ship and sail, you know, the Dharma vessel, if there are leaks in the vessel or the vessel is not functioning well, we have to either fix it or, or abandon ship and get another one. So, Bob, I so appreciate your saying that. And I did uh, leave my Sangha and my Lama because I felt there was a lot of competitive narcissism going on in the Sangha and that there were negative attitudes toward women. Mm -hmm. And um, it happened, by the way, I left my Sangha and my teacher um, just after I was getting divorced, as a matter of fact, and lost my home. So oh, I, I went through a real shakeup and... Making the film 30 Years in Tibet House was really wonderful for me, by the way, to, uh, to heal myself. But it, That's great, I, man. Hi, Hi, Heinrich Harrow only had seven years in Lhasa. You had 30 years in Tibet House. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I want to say that, that I, I did have a moment 
where I was not sleeping and I, I was losing faith in, in the Dharma, but I did maintain my practices. Eventually, it's those practices that help me heal and get through and wake up, finally, to wake up. Uh, are, you other relationship with are you now, John? Are, now, are you finally awake? Do you think a little bit more? No, no, a little bit more. So, not finally awake. Maybe there's a little more waking, but I'm, I'm not I, finally. I, I, Don't feel I, I, I'm, I'm open to surprises, Bob. Oh, that's good. That's I'm hoping good. you'll wake me up a little bit more tonight. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Well, we'll try. <laughs> we'll try. It may be hopeless. So, um, could you address the issue with Indian Guru? It says, we don't want to lose faith in, but seem to have engaged in a few consensual relationships between the power and balance of disturbing, without disturbing faith in that Guru. Well, I don't know, this sounds like a specific situation, which I can't really tell. But, um, I mean, if, uh, you know, I can't really say anything about what you, have you got anything to say about that one, John? I can't figure that out quite. You know, they had to, they, it means they've had some sexual relationships, but they were considered consensual. Yeah. And then, and there is a problem because they were a guru. So I think that if there were a few of them, then that, that one worries about that, you know, like a yeah. game. Blade, gay blade guru and um, in other words if there was one serious relationship and that was truly consensual then the power imbalance may, may have changed because if it's serious then and it's, uh, it's steady and constant then the male will be respecting the female and so then it, it should have to be consensual and the power imbalance changes because ultimately the female is more, more powerful actually that's for sure <laughs> It's unless unless the male is a, is a runaway, and uh, and an exploiter, so it doesn't sound good because you say a few to me, but that's just that, that's meaningless because I don't know the situation. Okay, next one. When people take refuge in a refuge ceremony, do they automatically receive the vow to not kill? No, they don't receive it; they take it, <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, and they, and they take it to not kill. And of course, you know, this is one of the five lay vows. Yes, yes, of course. Well, in the refuge vow, you don't have to become an opasika to take refuge. And the lay vow is the opasika vow, which is another step. And the refuge vow includes certainly trying not to kill, but maybe it's not as strict as the opasika vow, the next step, you know. And even there, you know, the karma... In ethical philosophy and practice of Buddhism is so uh, sophisticated that even, you know, because we do kill, you drive your car down the road and you squash insects or they hit the windshield. And, you know, and when you digest food, actually, you kill microorganisms. And um, even vegetarian, pure, clean vegetarians, they kill in their digestion process. And uh, vegans even. And so the Buddha is fairly aware that life involves, life and death go on, actually. Uh, but the point is, your intention is to serve, save, and preserve, and restrain as much as possible from taking life. And in the refuge, that's definitely part of it. Um, and it's, it's sort of part of the intention of doing that, because in a way, it's the first acceptance. But the refuge is emphasizing that you're getting protection. It isn't emphasizing that you're going to try to correct yourself, actually. That's the next step. How, how are you going to participate in it? Because when you take refuge in the Dharma, that means you consider the Dharma teaching is introducing you to reality and into what is better for you, how to behave, what to think, how to conduct yourself. And, um, and it's a long, gradual education process. And the word Adishiksha actually means higher education. And... Uh, it doesn't actually mean training. And, that, and it's not just a discipline, it's an education. And uh, discipline is part of it, but not all of it. So, so that's pretty easy. That's pretty easy. So don't worry about it if you happen to step on a bug or, you know, you don't lose your refuge. Buddha doesn't kick you out from the refuge. In fact, Buddha accepts murderers who seek refuge in the Buddha perfectly well. There are many historical cases. 
And there are people in prisons now who are finding solace in Buddhism. One thing I want to say, though, it's very interesting that you didn't address the film, John, and His Holiness didn't get into, but I was so pleased and struck in the recent online premiere that was done on the David Bohm film. I don't know if you attended that, John. Yeah, we saw it, yeah. Right. Well, did you notice at the end when, of course, that was not major on His Holiness, but there was some footage. And in the end, one of the things he did say toward the end when he had a little time there is he said, I want to be sure to let you know that in all of the teachings that I have given in my life, I have never taught Buddhist teaching to anybody with the intent to make them into a Buddhist. I don't know if you heard that clearly. Yeah. Yeah. But I really like that yeah. because there is this complexity that the people who are founding Dharma centers and who Oliver Stone very honestly, and I love that footage, by the way, he very honestly stated that he didn't like cults and he didn't like, some of them seemed a little cultic to him. He didn't like that. And he didn't want to be uh, join that sort of thing that the Dharma Center people are kind of creating churches, you know, they're in their Dharma centers, the ones who, who are, who that, that's kind of their profession, like their minister in an American church, a Buddhist church. And um, whereas the Dalai Lama, who is sort of the most popular teacher in America, in the world, but when he comes and he teaches a group of people who are not Buddhist, he doesn't say, I want you to take refuge. If he's teaching a group who have invited him to give them Buddhist teaching because they say they are Buddhists, in other words, he's not against Western people becoming Buddhists, and then he will treat them as if already Buddhists, and then he'll teach them in that way. But he's very careful not to be a missionary, is what I'm saying. Yeah. And I think that is very, I personally consider that extremely important in the, in the encounter of the Buddhism and the West that the Buddhism offers its services to Western people, whether they're religious people or secular people, with the, to benefit them if they like to use them without having to sign up and be Buddhist, if you follow me. Right. So I think that is very important. And then one says, well, does that mean they can't take refuge? Well, in a formal sense, perhaps it does. But in, in the way I understand refuge, where there's one way, there's two ways of teaching refuge. One is where the main refuge is Buddha. Although even there, they're thinking of Buddha as the body of Dharma. Then the other way that I think is more, is kind of more scientific and interesting is the main refuge is Dharma. And Buddha is the teacher opening the door of the Dharma. But the Dharma itself, which is the teaching that enables you to try to discover reality of yourself and for yourself, then in that case, it doesn't have to be Buddhist. Buddha is just one teacher who points to reality. And so do scientists, the good ones. And, and you know, maybe so does Jesus and Krishna and, and Lao Tzu, and they're all trying to discover reality, you know. So, so I like that way. That way to me is a safer way, you know. But anyway, that's, both are good. So Bob, you know, Carolyn, Christy also asked me what you thought about Guru Yoga. And, you know, I remember once we talked about that, you and I, and I think, please, please remind me, I mean, I think you said something along the lines that it, it's a very uh, kind of rare thing. It's not exactly uh, advised, you know, it's, it's a very particular thing, particularly in the West. Yes, well, see, that's something that uh, there hasn't really been, clear. there are a few books on how to depend on a guru. But in the Buddhist sense, you know, but they they not made it very clear, I think, precisely because the the a lot of the one thing you pointed out a lot in the movie, which I thought was good, where you said they're seeking they are seeking refuge in the West, and you mentioned economic, political, social, but you mentioned economic, sure, and that's that's kind of uh, that's realistic. And that is to say, a lot of the Tibetan gurus who come are seeking resources. They are seeking livelihood. They are seeking to create followers and organizations. And so in a way, their motive is not like it was in Tibet. Ah. They were already totally well settled and everything was teaching was free, but it was part of the culture to support them. So they, they didn't have to seek support in that sense. 
Do you know, I mean, they might end up being competitive with each other in sectarianism, which did occur to a certain degree in Tibet, but although not as much as Westerners think, actually, Western scholars think, not that much, actually. But there was some. And, but the ones when they come here, they're trying to make a home for themselves. So they're seeking, they, their intention tends to be a bit different. And, uh, and that creates a complication, you know. So, so, so therefore, it, it, Guru Yoga was sort of obvious to Tibetans because that, that's, but that's a completely a tantric uh, thing. Okay. Based on initiation. Okay. Which, which is supposedly not given to you until you have some understanding of renunciation, even as a layman, self-restraint, that is, some, some understanding of compassion, maybe Bodhisattva vow, and some understanding is absolutely mandatory that you have some at least inferential understanding of selflessness or emptiness. Yeah. In, in, in other words, the resilience and the flexibility of the self and you don't think of your identity you don't, you're not stuck in a, a rigid identity habit as the tibetans would call it as it's indians the great indian masters would call it the identity habit of i'm just exactly me because if you have that kind of a rigid identity habit and you receive tantric initiation and say oh well you are a deity you're a buddha you're a buddha you're tara blah blah oh boy then, you will transfer that rigid identity habit to some sort of de deity and you'll become overtly psychotic. <laughs> sure. And which, is what, which is what Carl Jung was afraid about when he talked, when he had a little taste of some of these uh, Tibetan teachings from uh, Evans Wentz and others in the old days. So, so the, in the, in the non-esoteric Buddhism, the model of the teacher is a friend, Kalyana Mitra, the virtuous friend who is a friend who inspires you to develop virtue and insight and a mental calm and contemplation and so on. And you don't do guru worship with that person. Your reliance on that person involves trying to follow the example, if it's good, and trying to learn the teaching. But then if you have those prerequisites that I just mentioned, and you want to move on to the very powerful and very wonderful tantra teaching, then you must pick someone to whom you're going to develop a higher degree of dependency in the sense of a guru relationship. And that's when you do guru yoga with that person. And then they have these wonderful controls about that, where you have to examine the guru for 12 years first to make sure he or she is cool, yeah. he's not going to molest you. Yeah. And, and he has to examine you for 12 years to make sure you're going to be cool, so you'll be practically dead before you, <laughs> you get initiated. So, and obviously they didn't do that in Tibet. So, so obviously we have to be more practical, but in any way, we have to be careful. And then I think we need someone to explain to kids this idea that the guru becomes like the lens through which the sunshine and the moonshine of the great great meanings of the tradition become focused on you or the, or the magnifying glass or to kindle you, the light gets focused on you. And if there's a crack in that glass, it's not so important because your visualization practice and your imagination practice, your, uh, you know, your fivefold purities or whatever these things are, you know, the purification of perception, you're engaging in to see through that guru to all the gurus, Vajradhara, you know, and uh, Narapa, and Dilpa, and whoever it is, Milarepa, and, uh, and uh, or the Dalai Lama. So you're seeing the guru as, as administering. And in that sense, because he, is, he or she is the one who transmits this wisdom of this lineage or tradition to you, you become extremely grateful to him or her and the more strong you are in your visualization, then the more you want to see the perfection of that guru. And then you really can get to where that guru can do no wrong. And even if they do something wrong, you will consider that a your benefit. And it has nothing to do with your fault. And there's a radical practice like that. Uh, where, and, but therefore, you have to be careful because in case the guy, the guy is really abusive, yeah. then you can get really in trouble with that. 
But that, that's where Guru Yoga really, Guru Yoga comes in, within that, that preparatory context, you know, and not just casually, you know, off the street, here I'm going to initiate you and now I dominate you, which is unfortunately how it is too often used. Yes, yes. And the, I love the Dalai Dal- Dal- particularly good about it. I love him. You know, he says, one time he said it one of these things. He said, well, you know, Westerners are so sweet and nice and they're so ready to be dependent because they grow up with their authoritarian personality structure coming from theism and the family structure, most likely, pat- patriarchality, you know. Uh, he said that I have to be very careful what I say because, for example, like Tilopa, when Tilopa would say t- ridiculous things, like if I had a real disciple, they'd jump off the roof here. You know, you know, yep. to show their determination. And then right. Nalapa would jump off and break every bone in his body. And then Dilapa would come down, climb down the stairs, and he'd go down with an Arapa and say, oh, what a moron. I, did you think I meant you to do that? That's crazy. And then he would pass his hand over Narapa's body and he'd be utterly healed right away. Yeah. So then the Dalai Lama said, here in Dharamsala, if I were to say a thing like, well, I think a real, real serious yogi would jump off this terrace here. If I said that, he said, okay. not only do I not have the power to heal them with a wave of my hand, but also, we don't even have ambulance service here in Darmstadt. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's but, what he said at the end of your movie. He said, people think I have miracle power. Disaster. What, what a disaster. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's a great thing. I think that's really cool. And I've seen Dalai Lama do it so many times. When he gives Kala Chakra initiation, he says, well, you know, then first he goes, nya, nya, I fooled you guys because I just gave you three days of teaching of the exoteric wisdom and compassion and renunciation teachings, right. which is what will really help you. And now we do a good luck omen thing of going through the ceremony. But actually, most of you, maybe there's two or three people really able to put this into practice and really ready to receive it. And I'm not really that capable, and I don't really have the qualifications to give it. He even says that. But, and, and, and that doesn't mean that he doesn't, because I think he does. Sure. But what he means is that he's taking off the freight of people thinking, oh, no, I'm really this. And then, uh, and then later, if they, don't, if they can't follow it, or they break something, they think I'm going to hell. Or if they get annoyed with the Dalai Lama, they go, oh, I hit the guru and I'm going to go to hell. Yeah. In other words, he's trying to make it as uncharged yeah, like, as you know. possible for people. Right. And he's giving it's up to the people to take responsibility for how seriously they're going to take it. You know, like, for example, I do, uh, I lead retreats uh, about Kala Chakra and other such things with people. But I always tell them it's like children playing with a dollhouse. We're playing house, you know, and we're having a little fake teapot and we're pouring tea and we're having, even making dinner and whatever. And we have, we're in the house. We put the little dolls around the house. So we're playing mandala house. Yeah. And so don't take it so seriously. Even you achieve the right number of mantras, even you do this ceremony, that ceremony, don't go around acting like, well, now I'm the Vajra Guru. You know, because it's, a, it's an endless, it's an endless thing. In a way, everybody already is to begin with. And, and in the long run, it, however, it takes a long time to really, really get it, pull it all together. You know? Bob, what do you so, think about Shempen Rinpoche saying that um, Buddhism is a path that eventually becomes pathless? What does that mean to us? Oh, that's very cute. Sure, that's cute. That means you integrate it. That means you discover it's yourself. And um, actually, someone sent me from Dharamsala a very short sutra that is one page which is really amazing. And it's about, it's called the Daka Yishi Do. You know, the, the, um, uh, the Sutra of the Intuitive Wisdom at the point of transcendence, which means, of course, transcending the, the body at death or transcending the normal identity, physical and mental, at Nirvana, at enlightenment. And, and it's a very short sutra, and it has four points. And, and the last line after the fourth point, repeated the second time in verse, he says, and the mind being the cause of 
the um, emergence of the enlightenment spirit, you know, the bodhicitta, uh, is the Buddha. And don't look for it, don't seek that in anything else or anywhere else. Which, of course, means that, you know, when everybody dies, the clear light of everybody hits the clear light. And in fact, hitting the clear light is the definition of death in, in, in Buddhism. And uh, it's but more explicit in Tantra and Vajrayana. And, and also, of course, becoming aware at the clear light level, super subtle level, is, is Buddhahood. And, and uh, that's, that's where everyone has, is Buddha every time they die. But they go past it so fast they don't notice it. Uh huh. Because they they are not ready to identify with the whole universe, because they're frightened to do that. They feel that the universe is full of dangers and they have a boundary and they're going to keep it away, keep it keep it away from them. So then, they, when they have a visceral experience of becoming everything, then they shrink away from that and they 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 rush across it and they miss it. So, but it's a beautiful little sutra. I couldn't believe it. It's an exoteric sutra called uh, Daka, uh, Daka, uh, Daka Yishi Do. Table, table, do. We have a question from Karen Anderson. Yes. Uh, Karen says Where's... the film, uh, it's the last question just recently. <clears throat> the film touches on the difficulties with tulkus. Yeah. In recent years since the Sak Young situation. The Dalai Lama has said that lineages are no longer relevant. Can you comment? Oh, I didn't hear him say that. I, I don't know what he uh, and I don't know what he meant by lineages in that context. I, the word lineage, I don't like that word personally. Uh, in for some for Guba, which means tradition or succession, you know, and lineage because a lineage is like some kind of pedigree, you know, like ancestry. But no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But I, I'm not sure that that's taken out of context what that means in the sense that uh, I'm really not sure. But but I feel sorry for the Sakyong, actually. I did from the beginning. I was very worried about him being made Sakyong uh, because I didn't feel he really had the experience. And um, and I didn't even know what Sakyong means, the, the Lord of heaven and earth. And I asked somebody, I won't say who, what does it mean? I said, what do you mean Sakyong, you know? And, uh, and he said, oh, well, this is a dharma from Eastern Tibet that was given to the king of Derge and to some of these places. Oh, then I said, that's great. That's wonderful. I, I was delighted. I said, so, so, so a great yogi, uh, Tertan, you know, a treasure finder, has a vision from Dakinis that he should trot down to the throne room of a local king and tell that king, you should be a bodhisattva king. You shouldn't be a nasty Donald Trump type of totalitarian, you know, torturing, oppressive king. You should be a Bodhisattva king serving your people. That's great. And give him a ceremony, get him to align the responsibility of royal authority with royal service. You know, the humblest person in the kingdom is the king because they're serving every single individual in the kingdom, the ancient Chinese Confucian theory of kingship. Wonderful, I said. And then I asked that particular Lama, I said, but, you know, I still am worried about this young man, you know, who's, from, who's a son of a uh, of, uh, of, of former incarnation, because, you know, he didn't grow up in Tibet. You know, he hasn't had a classical education. He's not a monk anymore. And uh, his father got in a little trouble here and there. And uh, in his case, he doesn't have a kingdom. He doesn't have subjects in a throne. He doesn't have a tax base. So, so therefore, he doesn't have royal authority ahead of time that you're asking him to exercise as a bodhisattva. So in a way, you're, you're giving it to him as if then he has to use that to create subjects. Yeah. And therefore, people who serve him and pay taxes to him and do his bidding. So he has to take, create an artificial country in the middle of a completely different society. And doesn't that put an unbearable pressure on him and on the would-be subjects? And he, well, yeah, I guess you know, he had to admit that that was an, in an analysis, but he just said, well, it's, I, I'm sort of, I, I, have to, I just have to do it. It's, it's tradition or something. 
tradition. So, so, so when he said his answer to it was realizing that had, there was a problem about it, and it was that it was tradition. So that's when the Dalai Lama is saying lineage are not relevant. He's saying that we have to reapply things and rethink them in new contexts. What I love about the Buddha and all of the great Buddhists in history is that the ones who really become enlightened, they, they, ha they usually have a big grin on their face and they say, wow, I have seen reality and I'm so happy and it is so great what it really is, bliss, void, indivisible. But, well, they don't say that right away, actually. That's no, later. But they say, really great, nirvana. And, however, I'm so sorry that I can't explain it to you <laughs> because it's inexpressible. Yeah. I wish I could. But if you just take what I say and make a dogma out of it, that won't help you at all. You have to discover it for yourself. You can't explain it. And when you do, you won't be able to explain it. You need the tools. So, Tools, yeah. So therefore, all teaching about relative reality, mm -hmm. you know, about the about you know causal interactions, relative reality, all such teachings are contextual. Uh -huh. They are a kind of they have validity in context, and then there are those that are invalid in context. So there is still a difference between some wrong illusory and helpful illusory and harmful illusory. It's all illusory. But there's bad illusory and good illusory. And so good illusory is the one that tends toward realization. Bad illusory is one that deepens ignorance and suffering, right? Yeah. So, so that's wonderful. So, so what His Holiness is saying where lineage is no longer relevant means that some pedigree or lineage. He said that years ago in our teacher, teacher conference that we had in Dharamsala a long time ago. To Jack Hornfield and Surya Dallas and everybody. And we're all over there, and they had a big struggle about whether I was allowed to go because I'm not a real teacher, I'm just a professor, blah, blah, blah. Finally, they let me come as long as I shut up. And, uh, but one of the things His Holiness said there was the only validation of a teacher is not whether they have this pedigree and that title and that certificate and that whatever. That's irrelevant, he said. The only thing that validates a teacher is if the students benefit from their teaching and example. That validates a teacher, he said. If they don't, it doesn't matter what they're called and what their title is. They suck if they're pretending to be a teacher. Yeah. He does say that. He said that even then. And there were some people in the room were like, oh, they didn't really like it. But he means it. He really does. And that's why he, he quit, you know. From, he didn't want to be able to head the country anymore. And he... You know, next life he won't, you know, and et cetera. And he is a great teacher, you know. But he doesn't, you know, the point is, it's serving the people. The teacher, Shakyamuni himself, is only there. Tulkus are there to serve the people. They're not there to be worshipped by them. Really, they're not. Yeah. That's, that's not interesting to them. They right. don't need all those offerings and all that stuff. They really don't. Uh, you know, only if some person is very stingy, then it's good for the person to give things and, be, <laughs> yeah, right. and, and to be less possessive and, and stingy and miserly. But, but, the, but the enlightened person doesn't need anything. And they, and they are not greedy. They have no greed because they are living in bliss, void, indivisible. They couldn't be more. The only pleasure they get is when people are relieved from suffering. Yeah. Other, when others are really are relieved from suffering. Otherwise they have full pleasure. And you know, well, somebody I know once who was an artist and a, and an esthete, a connoisseur, said he didn't want to attain nirvana because it would be too boring. Because the pleasure, pleasure was released from stress. And if you have no stress at all, then it's boring, it's no pleasure. But he, did it, he missed out on something about a bodhisattva. But anyway, it took me years before I could think of how to answer that. Because otherwise he was correct, actually. You know? And, and uh, you know, Mark Epstein has a wonderful expression in the book he wrote, how to get over yourself. Yeah. And, and an enlightened person, in fact, has, that's one sign of enlightenment is that person has gotten over themselves. Yeah. And if someone is very impressed with themselves, I'm a toku, 
then, or I'm a whatever, or I'm a great professor, if they are full, really full of themselves, then, you know, we have an expression in America for that, full of. <laughs> but, but, but Bob, is there, is there really a self to get over? Uh, yes, there is. He said that to you in the mo movie, John. Okay. He said there's a very strong self that, that, so. that wants to be a bodhisattva. So. And, and that is, he and Air is expressing an insight that psychology has come to that is better kind of psychology that, that the old-fashioned one was, oh, you have, to have, you have to build a strong and very rigid ego. No. Right. If you have a rigid ego, you're very fragile because when people don't treat you how you expect to be treated, you go berserk, like, like the current president you know, who is so fragile, therefore that's why he gets so upset if anybody says anything. As, as C.K., the comedian, the excessively narcissistic <laughs> comedian, he, yeah. but he did say brilliantly that the problem with him if president, if he were elected, is that he couldn't take any abuse from anybody because he's so fragile that if anybody says anything, he, everything stops and he has to, get, he has to destroy them or his, his ego collapses. But the strong ego... A strong self is one that knows it's transparent and knows and is responsible for the construct of the having a self and does so responsibly in, in, to, to optimally interact with others. And that gives you strength. That resilience yeah. gives you true strength. You know, rigidity makes you weak. You know, it's like, you know, the old the grass bends in the hurricane and then it pops yeah. up again. The rigid tree trunk snaps and that's the end of it. So, Bob, you're not, you're not being driven around by the ego. You are driving the ego around. Uh, well, oh, well, hopefully not too much. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you're, you're, you're te the it's, teachings with Dr. Nida are it's so... Just a pronoun. It's just a pronoun. The teachings with Dr. Nida are so interesting and, and important because they get into the, the experience of, you know, liberating and detoxifying and uh, into the solemn tigli and that aspect of, you know, purifying the energy channels and all that stuff. Yeah, and, well, he's a doctor, you see. Yeah. What's really great about Dr. Nita, he is a Nyingma Adi Yoga Ngakba guru. Yeah. Ngakba is like a Buddhist shaman kind of thing. You yeah. know, it's a kind of lay a yogi teacher. And, um, and he's, he is an Adi Yoga in the Nyingma. Very, and, and so was Yutok and the Gombo, who is his, that's his lineage, you know, Yutok and the Gombo. But uh, although he doesn't claim to be a tukul, although I think he practically is. I am always saying that, and I think so. But uh, the thing that makes it so nice and why he's so appreciative about, and so he was so upset himself about the poor students, women especially, who were sexually abused by various people. And, and he lives in Europe, so he knows all about it. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he really doesn't like that. Although he's, he's for sensuality in general, you know, and for, for that people having high energy and be feeling their inner energy. So he's fine with that, but he doesn't like that abuse. And, but the reason he's so good about it is that he is a doctor and people come to him with illness and sickness and suffering because of this and that trauma and that abuse and so forth in their families and everywhere, which there is so much abuse in the world. And women too are so oppressed still, you know, you know me too is just a get starting. You know, the feminist movement, Me Too, is still not really full traction on the planet. Never. Sure. But it will. It will get there. It's a very great, good step, but it's far from it. So anyway, listen, we can't go on all night. So, so what else is here? Any more really good ones? Or you want to make a final word, uh, John? Or I'm already talked too much. I'm sure if my wife were here, she would like be making the, making the sign. No, she wouldn't. No. Uh. Yes, yes, she would. No. <laughs> yes, you would. No, we're so grateful, Bob. But well, I well, I like the movie. It brings up a lot of images. Yeah. But uh, I think that this is the director's cut. But I, I think you can keep developing it. I think. I do too. I do too. Yeah, I, I want I, to. And um, I, uh, there's a lot well, to well, see. Yes. So in the meantime, you know, we're we're going to have a, a retreat up at Menla, and I want people to know about that, Caroline. Carolyn, uh, well, well, it might be electronic. Listen, um, don't, don't knock, hold on, don't knock electronic retreats. And also, of course, I don't knock people coming to Menla under our new kind of highly controlled individual package, you know, spacing, groups, you know, everybody, not really groups, but maximum like a family, maybe three or four people, but, right. you know, not much. And then 
if it was a group, we were going to be experimenting with those events that were originally planned to be a lot of bodies on campus. We we're experimenting with moving them to online if and when the time comes and, the, and because of the bad leadership, the lack of testing and tracing, the complete vacuum of federal leadership <laughs> in this and complete this irresponsibility and, 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 uh, and uh, harmfulness by these really stupid people. Uh, uh, this may be going on for a long time. So I'm just saying don't feel bad if it turns into being electronic because I'm saying that uh, things that I had planned to teach there with groups, you know, we would maybe have quite a good society group of people. I think we're going to do it electronically, but I've noticed that it's wonderful. And actually I get people translating into Spanish and I get 50, 60 people from Latin America, different countries that would never have come here because maybe one or two would have people from Russia and Germany, Italy. And so it can really expand actually really nicely. So it's not all pegged on having to go in the body, but if oh, a few sure. show up, if a few show up, and th th that's okay. But, yeah. but you, the point is, everything we're doing nowadays is live streamed, yep. and then recorded, and then made available in, in in private YouTube thing for people who want to subscribe to it and so on. So so you know, don't worry. I'm saying, however it turns out, it'll be great. Okay, it will. And even people can teach yoga and. My friend Paul Bloom, who's a great Tai Chi teacher, and he loves to come and teach at Menlo Tai Chi and does great, and a great uh, Qigong rather mainly and also Tai Chi. And uh, he's been teaching from Woodstock without traveling to New York or, or, Wood, or Millbrook right. or all of the places, or the Berkshires, the place he usually goes and teaches big classes. He's been teaching them with physical movement involved in yoga online and has bigger, bigger groups, actually. It's really great. Well, we want to we want to do our our, re, our virtual retreat from Menla. I think that'd be really beautiful. Well, that, that may work out too. Let's, yeah. let's hope so. Like a kind of a hybrid. Yes, yes. But I hope, Bob, that we see each other before the year twenty twenty two. I um, hope so, but you never know. But the one point is, this: look, what's wrong with this? We're seeing each other right now. Oh yeah. This is the mere magic body. This is the illusion body. You know, like this weekend, I got overtired, even my voice even a little hoarse. Yeah. And I did five, 10 hours with Alberto Villoldo on, uh, on the Quechua shamanism version of The Clear Light of the Void and Book of the Dead and Dumo and uh, the Tibetan one. And we, uh, the great giant serpent connecting between Tibet and, and, Latin, and the Andes, the Himalayas and the Andes, we did an amazing thing. And we had many more people we would have if you were here physically, and uh, went into Spanish and went around, and and, yeah. uh, and I really I felt he was I completely felt present from him I really did. Uh, I just I uh, said at the beginning, Bob, that I'm so grateful to Tibet House and Menla for keeping all of this resource alive and available. Well, we're trying to. It's really really fantastic, and I and hope we really will. You know, donate and get that matching grant. Uh, yes. Well, we we're about forty percent of the way there, right. and we and I usually Nina is you, my wife and Nina who really runs every Tibet house. I'm just a a, a a spokesperson, talk you know figurehead, but but the point is that uh, I usually she gets annoyed with me because I usually don't I just focus on Dharma and I don't bother to help fundraise, but now I'm pulling out all the stops. And even, and I can even announce here, it'll be on Facebook, but I'm imitating her, which she did last January. My birthday is August 3rd. Oh, yeah. And I'm asking people to give me a birthday present of five bucks or 10 bucks or 20 bucks to Tibet House yeah. uh, on, on my birthday. And I'm hoping to, that it will like, aggregate into a few thousand, actually. So I, I can announce even here, I can put in a plug. I'm sorry. Shamelessly. I apologize. Shamelessly, but, but, I, but no, I, other I, way. no other because, way. Because not for me. I don't get a salary. I've worked for our Tibet House as a volunteer out of gratitude to the Tibetan people and His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the great Buddhist teaching, Indo Indian and Tibetan Buddhist teaching that Tibetans have saved from where it was destroyed in ancient India a thousand years ago. And they have saved it for us and they're spreading it around the planet. And out of that immense gratitude to them, even though my own imperfections and it did not enable me to take 
as full a benefit of it as I should have. Uh, nevertheless, I am immensely grateful. And so the Tibet House, their cultural embassy of Tibet in America, His Holiness's official formal cultural center in America, holds the Dalai Lama, there's various holinesses, but the Dalai Lama one, uh, you know, and uh, to, it, with a view to preventing the Chinese from succeeding in their attempt, in their 70-year-long attempt to ethnocide, if not genocide, the Tibetan people. And uh, uh, re recently, some terrible things coming out of Tibet, where the party boss and Chinese party boss in Tibet said, first thing he said was there will be a policeman living in the house of every Tibetan family in all of Tibet so that they can show their love for the motherland, all the Tibetan families, living in your house, a cop. Right. And that, that's one. And then he followed up two weeks later, that same guy, to show how gung-ho he was. And he said, and a lot of Tibetan women should marry Chinese men to show their love for the motherland. I don't know what he thought to do about the Tibetan men, but that's genocide, you know. Yeah. That is genocide. As a policy, I'm saying, and, and a lot of action behind it. So that culture of Tibet, which, which has to keep Tibet alive to survive and also can help us all. And I, I like the way you pointed out in the movie how the sweetness of the people and uh, Martin Scorsese, the younger Martin Scorsese there, yeah. pointed that out, how he touched he was by the people yeah. and how the way they look at each other, the way they move. Oh, oh, yeah, it was Bertolucci also who pointed that out, the way they move. Yeah, and militia. And how they, and how militia. they appreciate each other. Yeah. And they, and so they have a certain lovingness about them. And that is true. And militia got it because they do meditate the idea that, that everyone has beginningless previous lives. They, this nonsense of you only live one life, they never would agree with that, as a, not as a, as a mystical matter, but as a scientific and commonsensical matter. So we've all been alive in evolution infinitely in the past, beginninglessly, and therefore we've all been each other's relatives and family and lovers and fathers and mothers and children and sisters and brothers. And, they, and so they went, that's why people like them. And when they look at another person, they, they have a kinship feeling in their eyes. They don't see an alien or a stranger in a funny way. I mean, they sort of do too, in the, but the inside is a central focus where they feel a kinship with other animals and humans because of that, that's the nature of that culture. Even they're gonna, you know, charge you too much at the bazaar, but they're still doing it. They're just, they're just being a little rough with their relative because they feel you are their relative. And that's the secret of why they are so attractive as people, you know, and, Bob, uh, Bob, and the culture. Yes, dear. You know, during this pandemic, we've, we've discovered also that people have such a strong yearning for community and for, you know, uh, having some consequence in the world as a community. Yes. Cultural activism. But, you know, the pandemic is also bringing out this in a very strong and powerful way in so many areas of expression with the uh, Black Lives Matters and the police, you know, all these, all these issues are suddenly becoming so impregnated with meaning and power. Well, absolutely. Well, we're at the end of the world, man. Yeah. The pandemic is just the first wave or, or, or of, of the climate catastrophe. Greta Thunberg yep. is, where, is taking the truth. The house is on fire. House is on it's fire. not just, uh, oh, business as usual gets back to the normal. Oh, great. And then we'll be flying around in the United Airlines and, and the oil will be pumping and the tar sands and the, and the Exxon Mobil. Be no way. This really has to happen, this shift over. We cannot treat the atmosphere as a sewer, as our Mal Gore beautifully puts it, you know, dumping trash in the atmosphere and the oceans. We cannot do that. The, the, this, this COVID-19 is just a tiny, small thing compared to the catastrophes that are coming. Yeah. With 2.53 degrees centigrade, the Arctic and the Antarctic melting, Himalayas melting, then you're talking global chaos. Yeah, so we're not going to have that. We are not going to have that. And right. there, because human being is not that stupid, finally. And so we're going to get rid of these idiot leaders who are hired to deny reality. 
and we're going to have those who are going to face reality and lead us to face it. And I'm very sorry to people, the thousands, the hundreds of thousands who have died because of this, so I'm not, I'm not delighted with COVID-19, but I'm grateful that our first big warning shot yeah. by Mother Nature sent out by the animals who are under the sixth great extinction, as Greta Thunberg will point out to us, uh, thanks, Bob. that, that they, this is a warning shot that we have to change the way we live. And that doesn't just include us not using plastic shopping bags, although that should be part of it. But we have to force them not to make so many damn plastic shopping bags and fill up the ocean with them so that whale stomachs are filled with plastic shopping bags. That is completely unacceptable. And we have to stop that. And that's all petroleum anyway. They're all b b shifting their investment into plastic manufacture, those guys, when they realize we're all going to have Teslas or Nissan Leafs or whatever, you know. And, uh, and they, they're not going to get away with that. We can't allow them to get away with that. They have to move into industries that, that are going to benefit humanity and not poison them. And, you know, the thing about the people of color and environmental injustice and the people of color being poisoned and therefore more vulnerable to the COVID. I yeah. just saw a pathetic thing on, on, on democracy well, now. Yeah. The Latino community, the yeah. Latino community is getting totally wasted. These very kind people who work in their farms and things in Texas and Arizona and these places, and they're much higher percentage than their percentage of population. They're being killed by the COVID because they work in pesticide riddled fields and this kind of thing. Yeah. So this has to, has to stop. Yeah. And, and the COVID is making us see that it has to stop. The police were killing the black people for ages and we have mass incarceration and they should all, nonviolent ones should be 100% let out immediately. They should simply be let out. If, if, when Joe Biden is inaugurated or coronated or whatever you call it, yeah. he should issue an amnesty to all nonviolent drug related, war on drug related, uh, incarcerated people and wipe their felony charges clean and give them subsidies to get educated for jobs. People got to vote, Bob. They better vote. Yeah, we got to deliver the Buddhist vote, John. And community <laughs> is unity. Community is power, man. <laughs> so look, here's here are a couple of jokes. You ever, you ever see this? You know this this thing, this snow globe. Yeah. Well. I put black volcanic sand in here, so it's like the earth, you know, if you shake it up, it goes black. Oh dear. <laughs> I made thousands of them. And the other day, uh, Emily and I were driving along Route 28, and we saw this crow walking very slowly across the road. So I, I looked at Emily and I said, well, nobody's flying anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I, have, I have a, okay, I have a joke. Okay. And I didn't tell it yesterday, which I, and then my wife scolded me for not telling it to all the people <laughs> in South America. But, but it's a little bit in the opposite direction, but it is a most amazing omen about men love. Oh, God. Which is, we were told, you know, uh, Ale uh, Alberto uh, Vilodo, my partner in, yesterday, in yesterday's thing, yeah. he asked me to talk about what Medicine Buddha Mandala is and what is Medicine Buddha and so on. And I... And I was explaining how Mandala of Medicine Buddha, when Buddha turns blue and gives Medicine Buddha teaching, what the Mandala is basically is that all the human beings who are there, and, and always when Buddha sees there's all kind of supernormal beings, I never say supernatural, supernormal, but the humans who are there suddenly see everything on the surface of the planet differently. And what they, because we normally see it as a sort of a mixed bag where there's some nice flowers and leaves, but they're thorns. You know, there's nice herbal healing things, and then there's poisons. Right. And then there's snakes, and there's this and that, and there's so the good and bad. But in the Medicine Buddha Mandala, everything is good. They're, they're, all the things are growing around us because they love us, biological creatures. We sure. can take care of them. Even a poison can be a medicine in a tiny dose for yep. some particular imbalance and so on. If you understand it thoroughly, you realize it's just paradise. The world, the planet is paradise. There's no being, it is Eden, the whole thing, if you understand it. And uh, so I was, I was going on and on about that anyway. 
and it, uh, and it was fun. And I said that it was the ambition at Menlo that we have is to create a place where by our prayer and our intention, because it's his holiness, it belongs to his holiness, actually, really, the Dalai Lama, although it's not a religious center, it's a healing center, uh, but it belongs to him. So anybody who sits foot there should just see things as all good, all benevolent, even the ticks. But of course, they stay away from the ticks, <laughs> yes. but they see them as good. Not right. they don't fear anything, in other words. Okay, so I just said that. So then we took a break, and then a pee break from our three-hour session, and we took a break. And then uh, Alberto, because he's a shaman, and he's in nature, and he loved that vision, and that's the shaman's vision in the, in the Amazon and the Andes. And he, uh, he suggested that everyone in the thing take an extra few minutes and go outside. Ah. Look, look at the trees and the flowers and things, and then come back for the next session. <laughs> so I went outside. So then I was walking around outside, and because there are very few bodies at Menla right nowadays, yeah. too few for the good yeah. of Menla, but never mind. <laughs> so I also did have to pee. So I was standing, because I've been drinking a lot of tea, as Tibetans do, in, in the middle of teaching. Sure. So I was, sta I was standing on a on a wall by some prayer flags with, uh, over a kind of drop where there was like bushes and, and you know, the forest, you know. And so I, just, I looked all around, there was nobody there. So I started to pee off the thing as you know, part of being in nature, you know, natural. And to my shock and horror, a chipmunk came running out from under the, under the wall that I was standing on, <laughs> eight feet below me. And did not, did not avoid the stream, but plunged into it with abandon. Lucky and danced around with a golden shower. Oh my God. Yeah. And I was, I was trying to miss it because I was feeling polite, you know, with the, and I was trying to aim somewhere else, but kept following it around. Yeah. And then not only that, but my last, after then I finished, you know, I was so shocked. And then he <laughs> retreated back into his little lair under the wall. But his head was still sticking out, and he was still frolicking around. He was all sopping with pee. And then he was, the last thing I saw was he was licking his, as it was dripping down his nose. He was slurping it down like that uh, famous Mohan, what was it, Mosing, the famous Indian prime minister who used to drink. <laughs> was, right. and, I, and I was just totally shocked. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and then... I went back and then because my engineer was calling me back because I, I was taking too long. And uh, then he said, oh, it's a great omen. And then there's a, I said what happened and I was just <laughs> shaken. And then there was a crow flying by, also a crow, which made yeah. me think about it. And the right. crow was flying. Yeah. And he said, there have been very few crows lately, but because there's no people, so there isn't any extra food still has been thrown right. over the edge. So I'm sorry, I know that's a really horrible thing. I apologize to everybody. It was such an off color story. But it's a sign that at least the chipmunk had the vision of Medicine Buddha, where everything was good. One taste, man. <laughs> One taste at Menla. Oh, an enlightened chipmunk. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not enlightened, but the chipmunk was. Well, That's Menla it. is a Buddha field. That's all there is to it. I man. hope so. I hope so. Everywhere is a Buddha that, field. The, the only thing I heard is that people who um, have their heads up their butts don't need masks. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I think that's a good one too. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, guys, we're really, we're really gone to the dregs here. But anyway, <laughs> that's the key thing. Everyone should, you know, one thing. A lot of those llamas, I have to say, everyone. I want to just encourage. If anybody's left, maybe everybody's run away by now. I don't know why it will tell us he didn't stop us. But this is my last statement for the night. No, and that is that. Although it's very true and it's very important that everybody pays attention to the first noble truth and the nice Ani Chuying, whatever, you know, the one in the cave, Tenzin Belmo, the wonderful, venerable Tenzin Belmo. Yeah. He was saying how it's not really happening, there's no fun. And even that, that Zongzar, who, has, who enjoys fun himself, but he was like, no fun, it's not fun. It was not fun. Uh, but I'm sorry, that's wrong. There is the first noble truth, which Buddha stated. But he only stated that after he discovered the third noble truth, which is the real one. And that's freedom from suffering. And that means fun. Freedom from suffering is a conservative way of putting fun in the, in the focus. 
And yeah. that's what Buddha discovered, why he was smiling. He was not smiling on the morning of his enlightenment because he realized everybody's going to be miserable. No, because he realized everybody can find reality which will make them feel happy and which will make them realize that life is fun, free of suffering. So don't get too serious about it all. And if you're doing practices and things that are making you too unhappy, remember Buddha rejected his own self-mortification for six years. Yes. And he did a middle way. And he decided that, there, that if, you, if what you do makes you miserable, it must not be quite the right way you're doing it, not you're doing it the right way. Okay? So it should give you immediate fun as well as ultimate fun. Okay? That's all I wanted to say. And thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, John. And congratulations on your film. And I'm ready to be a, a consultant anytime you would like for, you, for the final cut. Uh, and, I can't and, wait, Bob. And, uh, and now I'm going to leave the, the event. But, and I appreciate it. I, I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. <laughs> Bob, we're, we're all tuning forks. And you are okay. a great tuning fork for all of us. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. You too, John. Okay, Love take you. care. Okay, bye. Love you. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit our websites at tibethouse.us or menla.org.